USCHO.com. This is the USCHO Week in Review podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online at USCHO.com. A look at this weekend in college hockey and a review of the top news of the week. Welcome to the USCHO Weekend Review podcast, episode three. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly. And uh, with number one going down, why don't we start there? Ohio State ended up earning a split on Saturday with UMass, or should we say hashtag new mass, uh, something that you called for in our Game of the Week podcast last week. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those series that I just had that feeling that UMass had a lot of uh, momentum coming in, a lot of confidence in Ohio State. You're going back, and, you know, you're, you're in front of your home crowd, and you know, it's one of those things where there's a little bit more pressure. I still say on teams, whenever they play at home, everybody loves to make the most of home ice. But when you're a top ranked team and maybe you're not that, you know, experienced being a top team. And, you know, this is the first time Ohio State's ever been number one in the country. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult. And that's kind of, I think, what happened on Friday night. UMass got some early momentum and they got a, a lead and just kept finding ways to expand on it. And ended up winning Six to three. And, uh, you know, credit to Ohio State. They did battle back a a Saturday afternoon matinee game uh, and the ability to find a way to get that game tied at one in the third period and then find the game winner. It was a late game winner uh, that gave Ohio State what ultimately was a three to one victory, but uh, broke the, the, the one one tie late. And, you know, that's the sign of a good team. I do think that we're going to see UMass get probably a little bit more of the credit it deserves coming off that weekend. Uh, you know, I think voters have been very, you know, lukewarm on the thought that they would give them any votes in the poll. But uh, I think people are now going to realize this is a darn good UMass team. You know, I, I had that kind of insider information that they were playing well and that they had that confidence coming into that series and, and it, it panned out. So I think you'll see, uh, in this week's poll, a little bit more recognition for UMass. You know, in Ohio State, they they did garner that number one without having played a game. So it was just a matter of attrition with the other teams around them going down. Correct. And, you know, and it's it'll be interesting uh, to see how voters feel uh, in a few hours on, on Monday uh, around noontime when the poll comes out. Do people now just default Notre Dame back to number one or do people say, well, Ohio State, you know, it's just a small blip. They should still should be the number one team. I think the the overall number of first place votes in this week's poll is going to be extremely split, uh, more so than you might see in the average week. Well, let's go on to another one where it was a weekend sweep and those were kind of rare this weekend. But Union swept Northeastern number 20 Union against the number 12 Huskies, a 4-3 overtime win on Friday and then 3-1 to on Saturday. Uh, what's up with the Huskies? Well, I think, you know, we've talked about it a lot. We talked about it with Jim Madigan in last week's Game of the Week podcast. Uh, and there's a need to replace a lot of offense. You know, I believe it was 76 goals from last year's team, either uh, you know, that all came from one line and it either graduated or left early. Uh, you know, when you look at uh, a trio of, of forwards that, that left the program, they have to find a way to score those goals. In week one against Sacred Heart, they put up 10 goals and nine different scores. That's all nice. That's all well and good. This weekend, I think they had a little bit more trouble creating offense. I think a more talented defense for uh, for Union and particularly in the Saturday night game, as that game wore on, Union became more confident, more confident defensively. And when it came down to the third period in Northeastern trailing two to one, Union did not allow them a grade A opportunity. They never even really sniffed near the net in the third period. There was one bad angle shot on a rebound on a power play with about uh, 13 minutes left in regulation. That was the only real chance that Northeastern had to score. Uh, to tie the game, that was a save that was made. And next thing you know, Union pops one in the net uh, a little bit later, and, and it's a 3-1 victory. Now, I think that they got a little bit lucky on Friday because I think that Northeastern had a lot of momentum in that game, and it's almost like they found a way to lose it, You know, jumping out to a 2-0 lead, having a 3-2 lead in the third, and then uh, allowing Union to tie and then win it very early in the overtime. So 
it was a great sweep for Union. I do have small concerns about Northeastern, but they has, they, they're still a good team. Uh, they did lose uh, Davies, Jeremy Davies, their All-American defenseman, to an injury. A lot of speculation what the injury was. Was it a shoulder? Was it a concussion? It was a big hit on Friday night's game. That's somebody we're going to have to keep an eye on as the next few weeks go on because that's a big key to their power play. Uh, to really playing well in their defensive zone and really getting that offense from the blue line. He's probably the best offensive player really maybe remaining on that team right now when he's at the defense, defensive position. Well, offensively, Jim Madigan mentioned when we spoke with him last week for the Game of the Week podcast that scoring was probably going to be spread out more among his lines. He, he lost what sometimes was a top line, but sometimes split into two lines last year. He also expected that union would reflect sort of the, the toughness and grit of their coach, Rick Bennett. And it sounds like, uh, especially in the third period on Saturday, they did the last couple of seasons. Union has also been a very fast team. Uh, did you see that also? A little bit. Yeah. I thought that their speed, especially their top top line uh, through the neutral zone. They get a lot going. They were very good on face-offs, uh, that top line on Saturday night. And then defensively, I thought they all got back, uh, really back check well. They, they kind of defended as a team. They kind of moved up the ice very well as a team. So there's some, re- there's some real talent. But, you know, going back to what you were saying about that, that, that kind of gritty identity that their coach represents. And Rick Bennett, if you know you see him, he's just a monstrous guy. You know, probably six four, six five, big hands. You can tell when he was a player, he was a hard nosed guy. And uh you can, you know, that that mentality and, and kind of personality still does translate to his team. People remember that national title team uh, a few years back, uh it was it two thousand twelve, I believe, and or maybe it was fourteen. Four two thousand fourteen. Uh and that that title team you know, had a lot of skill, had some really high end players, but at the same time, they were gritty. They were blue collar. And I, that, that's really how I'd, I caught what I'd, how I'd identify this year's union team. They have confidence, though. And that's something, you know, talking with Rick Bennett last night after the game, he felt that his his players are starting to gain some of that confidence. They started 0 5 last year. They're 4 0 1 this year. That's a big difference, big turnaround at the start of the season. Well, while we're talking Hockey East, let's look at Boston College and Boston University. BC, again losing on Friday. They haven't won an out-of-conference game uh, since November of 2016. Uh, BU was blanked for the first time ever by Merrimack. And uh, both those teams now, those programs have started 0-3. And from what I understand, it was right after the end of Prohibition that the, those two teams were last 0-3. It's kind of crazy to think about. And obviously there's no real correlation between the two when you're really uh, thinking about that. But at the same time, you know, to go back to the 1930s, since those teams started 0-3, it just shows how dominant they've both been uh, in respectively and oftentimes together. Uh, you know, this year they're both struggling a little bit out of the gate. Of course, a new coach, uh, at Boston University, Albie O'Connell taking over for David Quinn. But you look at BC, and as you mentioned, it's been a real long time. They didn't win a single non-league game last year. Uh, they're now 0-3 out of the gate this year in non-league play. Confidence, believe it or not, as as strong, I think, a personality as Jerry York is and as confident a man and a coach he is, sometimes when your team just – finds or starts reading these headlines about boy they haven't won out of conference in this long or that long even if you have the greatest personalities and the greatest will in that dressing room that can still start creeping in and when you're in a close game and you're you're either tired or you're down you know down a goal it sometimes can be harder to come back it's it's the same confidence that on the other hand when you've had two or three comebacks in a third period where you come back from a goal or two down, you start to believe you can always do it. It goes the other way when you have anything creep into your head, I think, especially at the collegiate level. Boy, we haven't done this in a long time. I don't think we're doing it tonight. That's that mentality that can kind of creep in. I think that I don't want to say that that's definitely the case with BC. I haven't seen them. It's not fair. I think I'll see them this uh, Thursday night when St. Cloud comes to town. But uh, it's something that you have to think about in that locker room, where is that confidence level right now? 
Well, and that one, that game with BC being a game that was non-conference really adds to some of the troubles that we talked about last year, right about 500 for Hockey East uh, out of conference. And that all has huge implications for the postseason. So I'm sure the other 10 schools in Hockey East are keeping their eye on that as well. Yeah, you know, it's it's just it didn't get any better this weekend. We talked about it a little bit last weekend where uh, Hockey East was a 500 team going into this past weekend. They're now below 500, six games below 500 for that matter. Uh, you know, th- there just it wasn't a lot of non-league success yet again. You look at Northeastern getting swept, BU they they lost ended up that was actually a conference game they lost but BC losing uh Lowell dropping one down in, in Miami there was just a uh, UNH I think got swept out of Colorado College so there's just a lot of struggles right now in the non league uh setting for hockey east and as we talk about at this time of year you you get to mid November and you're a, you're a team in the 400 winning percentage you're not going to be getting a lot of teams into the NCAA tournament it's so far away to think about that but at the same time, you know, you can't take a 400 record come Thanksgiving and hope to be 600 by the end of the season. You can't jump up that much. There's not enough games out of conference games left to be played. So then you conversely look at it and, and the Big Ten and uh, the NCHC, Big Ten's a 739 winning percentage right now. NCHC, a 654. Those are great winning percentages. And it's going to it's going to show come March when we look at the NCAA tournament fields and you might have nine teams in the field that come from those two conferences. You can remember back to these weekends in late October and say, boy, that great play early for those two conferences really paid off. This is the USCHO Weekend Review podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online. Well, Jim, you're just mentioning dominance and dominance is probably a good word to use for Notre Dame's performance over Omaha this weekend. Yeah, and particularly on uh, on Saturday, uh, an 8-2 to two win, four shorthanded goals by Notre Dame in that game. They had two goals from four different players on that night. Uh, it just felt, you know, you, you're talking about outscoring an Omaha team that maybe, you know, isn't as strong as in past years. They're, you know, they're probably going to be the, the lower tier of the NCHC, but you know, you're talking about beating an Omaha team on the road by a combined score of 12 to three. That's pretty good over two nights. And I, I feel like a lot of things are clicking for Notre Dame. Uh, you know, obviously, they get that win in the icebreaker tournament. We talked about it last week. The, you know, game one out of the shoot was a 6-6 tie. That was after an exhibition game where they lost to the U.S. under 18 team. So, you know, maybe you left last Friday night saying, hmm, how good is Notre Dame? Well, a four nothing shutout, a four one win, and an eight two win since then against three you know three games against two pretty good teams. Uh, we know that Notre Dame it will be one of the best teams in the country this year. There's no doubt about that in my mind, and they're starting to answer a lot of those questions early. Well, it was a non conference tie for Denver against Alaska on Saturday night, and this was in dramatic fashion. You don't often see you know we know that. If you pull your goaltender and hope to uh, come back down a goal that, you know, it's probably about less than 20 percent of the time you even get to score that that uh, tying goal for Denver. They were actually down by two goals when they pulled their goaltender with two minutes left in regulation uh, to Alaska. And Cole Gutman scored with uh, 152 remaining and then Lester Lancaster of a great shot from the uh, the left point through a lot of traffic. 35 seconds left on the clock. That tied the game. It really, really created a uh, a great atmosphere in Magnus Arena. That place was going nuts when that puck went in. Uh, maybe fortunate for both teams that it ended up a tie. Denver probably would have loved to get the, uh, the goal in overtime to win that one. Alaska, I think, just really wanted to hold on and at least – leave Denver with something to show a a three, three tie, but uh, a a great comeback for Denver, kind of a rough ending for Alaska. I think, you know, there was probably a bit of fairy tale in in their mind when you're up by two with two minutes left at Denver on the road, nationally ranked team. It's been a tough start for Alaska. We documented, you know, their first week of the season where they didn't score a single goal in two games against Arizona state. So it would have been a great 
booze for Alaska. I think they're probably happy to escape with a tie, um, but they, they probably wanted a lot more. Well, you mentioned uh, Les Lancaster. He was rookie of the year, his freshman year in Atlantic hockey, a graduate transfer to Denver. And a lot of people have been looking toward his performance to see how uh, maybe the talent level matches up in Atlantic hockey. Now, speaking of Atlantic hockey, right now a dismal 5-17-2 out-of-conference record, uh, 250. But two of those five out-of-conference victories uh, go to RIT, and one of those was last night a, a fairly decisive 6-1 win over uh, Colgate at the annual Brick City homecoming game uh, in the downtown AHL arena. Last year was the only year in the last nine that it wasn't a sellout, but a sellout on Saturday night of 10,556. And it was a sea of orange, uh, which is the the little hashtag that the, the uh, Tigers are using this year. Uh, they gave out 7,000 orange T-shirts, so you can just imagine. But a good start, two and one for the Tigers. Yeah, you know, and obviously you, you get to experience that game in person. Uh, calling those games on the radio for RIT, but what it's it, it impresses me every year knowing that uh, an Atlantic hockey team, where we know that attendance is you know way down compared to the rest of the nation, uh, you know basically on an average across that league, they take ten thousand plus fans and put them in an arena one night. It's a great atmosphere it creates. I saw some of the clips from it last night, um, you know, but I also. No, after having watched RIT the first weekend uh, of the season against Lowell, that's a pretty good team. And yeah, I don't know how they'll fare out in Atlantic hockey. I've always thought that's one of the strangest things about that league is that you can watch some of these teams perform in non-league games and perform so well. And then you see them get into the league and they, it's almost like some of them play down to you know, a level just a step lower. And it's enough to maybe keep you from winning a regular season title or keep you from winning the league title. Uh, I think that RIT, if they played the way that I've seen them play night in, night out throughout the entire season, they should be the champions in that league. They are a good team. Uh, you know, there are some other good teams. I think that it's probably, a, you know, a, a pack of three to four teams that have that ability to compete at that level. But RIT, that they have kind of put their stake in the ground as a good team out of conference that if they can bring that into the conference, they should be one of the more dominating teams in Atlantic hockey. One last quick note on RIT. Goaltending was a real problem for them last year. 872 combined save percentage, 60th out of 60 teams in Division One. Last night, sophomore Logan Drack at 41 saves on 42 shots. So that was a, a pretty remarkable performance. Some quick hits, uh, splits on the weekend. Western Michigan and University of Michigan, each one at home. Miami and UMass Lowell split, also splits between Ferris State and Mercyhurst. Yeah, I mean, the, the Michigan one kind of stands out to me because I think that Michigan needed some confidence. Uh, and, you know, they would have loved to have swept, but at least you you get that home win. You know, you open up the season against Vermont and lose in your building. That's never something that a coach uh, likes to go through, especially with the expectations that kind of were on Michigan and Mel Pearson going into the season. So that's a big one. Uh, we've talked to Rico Blasi uh, on our podcast this year. I think that Miami team is playing pretty well right now. Uh, they they had a little bit of struggle scoring on on uh, really on the entire weekend, just two goals uh, over the two games against Lowell, but good, got good goaltending and defense last night and able to you know take a two to one win after a three nothing loss on Friday. So uh, credit to to them for that. And then Mercyhurst, I think that's kind of a good win for Rick Gotkin to be able to go on the road to Ferris State. And, uh, you know, that's a. a good bus ride home and you know when you get to do it with a win in your pocket in that last game it really puts some confidence in so for Mercyhurst I think that's a really big win uh any you know we you kind of were alluding to a big big wins for Atlantic hockey are always welcome because there doesn't seem to be enough huge wins if you will or really even you know moderately big wins as you know they've got to find ways to win these out of conference games so when a team like Mercyhurst can go on the road and find a way to win. That's a that's a really good feather in the cap for them and the league. Well, Jim, we could go on and on with all the different games, but time doesn't permit it. I did promise on social media on Friday night that I would 
uh, comment a little bit on five on five and three on three overtimes. I have tended to be against it and happy to see a tie. Two things on Friday led me to rethink a little bit uh, with some caveats. One, uh, it was an early start for the RIT women against Union. So on my way home from the office with no game to call Friday night, I stopped in and watched that. And it got to a point with penalties where there was about a minute of three on three. So something clicked in my head to say, you know, you talk about three on three not being hockey. Well, it's not typical hockey and it's pretty rare, but it's still part of the game. So that was one item. And then I was watching the excellent coverage of Notre Dame and Omaha on CBS Sports Network uh, on Friday night. And during the first intermission, uh, Ben Holden had a pre-recorded interview with NCHC Commissioner Josh Fenton. And, and Josh made the case, which he's made to us before, too, when we've had him on our various programs, about having a decision and having a winner. And I got thinking about that, and I said, you know, I'm okay with five on five and three and three. Maybe I would reserve a shootout for league standings. But the thing that is an issue to me is making sure that there is, for lack of a better term, partial credit for teams who make it through each round of, you know, into overtime in each round of that. Uh, in the pairwise. Now, from what we understand, that was a consideration, but it probably is not going to happen. I'd be in favor of five on five and three on three if there was a way to give, uh, instead of, you know, the equivalent of one point each in over in the first overtime, you know, maybe a, a little bit more. Something's got to factor in there. You can't make it uh, all or nothing in the pairwise and have it be a fair situation. So if the NCAA can come up with a way to have some partial credit for those, then I would support doing it across the board in all the conferences. Yeah, I, I think I'm on board with you there, Ed. And, you know, I think that it's been looked at and, you know, there, there is kind of a mathemat mathematician behind the scenes, Tim Danahy. Many people know him, many people don't. He's a quiet guy that has worked with the NCAA for a long time and just trying to help them figure out the formula of the RPI and how, you know, tweaking it here and tweaking it there will affect things. And I think the one thing that coaches have been trying to find is a way to have these various overtime systems, hopefully something universal, um, but in, in, in earning wins and losses that you're not going to be giving a full win in a shootout. You're not going to be giving a full loss in a shootout or a three on three for that matter uh, when it comes to the pairwise. So it's really just adjusting the RPI that, you know, you can have it, you know, just like the, the NHL, a, a regulation win counts as a certain amount an overtime win, it's just basically an extra point. So it's not the same, but if you would, for example, say that a win is worth 100%, a loss is worth 0% in the RPI in terms of how you move your RPI, a, an overtime win, in my opinion, should be worth 67%. And an overtime or a shootout loss is worth 33%. So at least you're getting some sort of a hit, a positive hit in your RPI instead of just taking basically a zero for that night. So that is, I believe, the major issue. That's the one that can't be solved. I do believe that there are some coaches, you know, co coaches still look at wins and losses as their job. Right. There's no doubt about that. And if you're going to represent a shootout win as a win in your overall record at the end of the season, then you're also going to probably represent a shootout loss as a loss in your overall record. And if you're a team that, you know, goes to overtime, it's not, not an exaggeration to think that teams can play there 10 times in a year and you go two and eight in shootouts, you know, that could have been, uh, you know, you've, you've only given yourself two wins where you've added six losses and you don't have your ties anymore. So it's, it's, I see why coaches are worried about it, you know, because at the end of the day, it still looks like a loss to your athletic director. It looks at a, like a loss to your league, to your school president. Right. It maybe even looks at a lot like a loss to the commissioner. You know, it, it that is what becomes the big issue. And coaches don't want to lose their jobs over some skill competition, which is what a shootout really becomes. 
in regardless of how much excitement it creates for the fans. That, I think, is where the issue comes. If they can find a way to change that and make it represented differently without having literally a, a record that's wins, losses, overtime losses, shootout losses, you know, those types of things where you'd have to literally, you know, be putting five different categories in to understand somebody's record, then I'm all in favor. Yeah, the other thing that was mentioned to me by one of the commissioners who uh, is in an Eastern League and not in favor of this is how long you drag out things. Say a game starts for television at like 7.37 or 8.07 or some time like that. That means regulation. Say it's an 8 o'clock game, 8.07. Regulation is going to be ending around 20 after 10 or maybe 10.30, depending on TV timeouts and so forth, to accommodate a television broadcast. Then you've got an overtime that'll take you 15 minutes. And then if you get a three on three, there's another 10, 15 minutes. And now you're, now you're pushing 11 o'clock and then it's time for the shootout and it's number of rounds. And all of a sudden you've got people hanging out there for three and a half hours uh, on a Friday night uh, for something. So, you know, there's the fan aspect. Yeah. Fans like to have a conclusion, but fans also like to get home before they turn into pumpkins. Yeah, I get that too. Uh, I think that the people that are in favor of this say that fans are just so happy to see fun hockey, which is what three on three looks like and becomes, and a shootout, which is something that's really fun for the fans. They'd rather sit there and wait for that than worry about what time they leave. But you're right. You don't want to drag these games on any longer. It makes it a little bit more uh, unbearable. So that is uh, that I think is a big part of it as well. I really think it comes down to just how you count the wins and losses. And if you can't find a way to to, you know, basically give significant credit to a team that loses in a shootout, then it's never going to get the uh, full support that it needs across the NCAA. Well, I guess we're pretty much agreed on that and we've run over on time. So we'll wrap it up here every Sunday. Catch USCHO Weekend Review podcast on Tuesdays, it's the USCHO Spotlight, a long depth interview. And on Thursdays, the Game of the Week podcast. Go to uscho.com slash podcast in your favorite podcatcher to subscribe. For Jim Conley, I'm Ed Trefsker. We'll catch you next time. This has been the USCHO Weekend Review Podcast, a production of U.S. College Hockey Online. Visit uscho.com slash podcasts to listen or subscribe. 